welcome to our guests and our members and to our special speaker tonight. As recently as 2015, and in an age of sophisticated distress technology and safety equipment, a maritime tragedy led to the loss of the entire crew of the SS El Faro. Tonight, we are privileged to welcome Captain Morgan Terrell, who is the acting director of the Office of Marine Safety at the National Transportation Safety Board. He will talk about how the NTSB, along with other agencies, investigate maritime accidents and make recommendations to improve maritime safety. Captain Terrell began working at the NTSB in September of 2003. He was named Acting Director, Office of Marine Safety in March 2020. Previously, he served as Deputy Director, Chief of Investigations, and Senior Marine Accident Investigation. He is responsible for the investigation and report development of major maritime casualties in the United States and on vessels worldwide, on U.S. vessels worldwide. He led the agency's investigation of the El Faro sinking, including the retrieval of the voice data recorder. Morgan previously worked for the Princess Cruise, where he was vice president of marine investigations. After graduating from the United States Merchant Marine Academy in 1987, Morgan served as a licensed deck officer aboard a variety of commercial vessels. He was project manager at the University of Washington School of Oceanography and master of its research vessel. Morgan earned his MBA from Pepperdine University and is licensed by the United States Coast Guard as a master of ocean vessels of any gross tons. So Morgan, I will turn the program over to you at this point. Thank you. Thank you. NTSB's mission is to investigate transportation accidents and issue safety recommendations to prevent similar accidents in the future. The NTSB does not regulate transportation safety. That responsibility is held by the Department of Transportation. Our effectiveness is grounded in our reputation for conducting thorough, accurate, and independent investigations. We produce timely, well-considered recommendations to enhance transportation safety. This is our mission. We are the NTSB. Good evening. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I hope it's an interesting conversation. Uh, we'll be making a presentation and then have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, after the presentation. First, let me thank Liz and Kristen for their hard work of putting this program together. And uh, the, the Marconi Museum is an important museum for the United States and the Merchant Marine in general to uh, preserve the history of radio communications. And I'm really pleased to be here tonight. I would have enjoyed being there in person uh, and hopefully one day I will. So uh, I've not had a chance to see the museum myself, but I look forward to doing that whenever uh, conditions permit. So with that, we will get started. So first a little bit about myself. I think uh, Liz covered it pretty well. Um, one thing I wanted to add was since my career began in 1987, I've held three radio licenses. The first was a VHF permit as a third, third officer operating on US ships. And then uh, as a mariner, I've held three radio licenses in my career, a VHF permit. And then later on, I earned a general radio telephone license, which as uh, radio officers left the US Merchant Marine, uh, the, the deck officers took over those duties. 
And then uh, later in my career, I, I got a GMDSS qualification uh, after some training. So I do have uh, some, some basic working knowledge of the radio community when it comes to the Merchant, Mar uh, Merchant Marine anyway. So um, I was also uh, privileged to work with uh, a great staff at our agency and uh, they're all also Merchant Mariners, uh, a few Coast Guard individuals as well. And we, uh, we have a great team in their office. So I wanna thank them as well. Okay, here we go. So here's the program this evening. I'll talk a little bit about the agency uh, the NTSB itself, and then more about our office in particular and how we investigate accidents. And then we'll talk a little briefly about our current investigations, developments in the agency before we talk about the Alfaro. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions after this presentation. So if you're thinking about questions, like Kristen said, you can look at the Q&A uh, on your screen there and we'll get to your questions at the end. So the National Transportation Safety Board is a panel of five presidential appointees. Uh, they are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate and they serve a five year term. The chairman and vice chairman serve three year terms uh, in addition to their term as a member. Uh, we have right now we have a full board, which is uh, not always the case. The agency is approximately 425 employees. Our budget's approximately $120 million a year. Uh, the agency is approximately 150 persons in aviation. We have a laboratory that's a shared uh, materials laboratory that has approximately 50 employees. Our other modes, including rail, pipeline, has materials, highway and marine, represent about another 100 people. And then there's 100 staff. The marine office is the smallest mode in the agency. Uh, yet we still handle investigations uh, wherever they are, including uh, in foreign destinations if a U.S. flagship's involved. So our primary mission is uh, we are an independent federal agency. We do not report to the DOT. Uh, Congress created us in 1974 uh, in the Independent Safety Board Act. So originally we were part of the DOT and we uh, we realize over time that a lot of our recommendations were going to our host agency and in order to, uh, for public integrity purposes, they made us independent. So this is going on over 50 years now as an independent agency. We determine the probable cause of accidents and we issue safety recommendations and they aimed at preventing future accidents. These recommendations may be to organizations, uh, manufacturers, company operators, in order to affect safety change. We also carry out safe special studies uh, and research. And when an accident occurs, we coordinate the resources of the federal government, uh, including agencies like the Coast Guard, the FAA, the Federal Rail Administration and others. Uh, one of the other functions that we have since the terrible accident of TWA 800, the uh, 747 that crashed in Long Island Sound, uh, the Congress gave the NTSB the job of taking care of families and informing them of developments of an investigation, giving them factual information. And so we've been doing that since that time in all modes, including Marine. And in particular, in the Marine office, uh, our particular mandate, and it's different from mode to mode, so aviation will investigate every single U.S. civil aviation incident and any US built aircraft, so Boeing, anywhere in the world. So they have a large mandate. Ours is any ma major marine casualty, which occurs within US waters. And I'll talk about what a casualty is in just a moment. Anywhere in the world aboard US flag vessels, any accident involving a US government owned vessel, such as a Navy destroyer uh, or a Coast Guard vessel uh, has an accident with a non-military vessel. We also assist other, nation, uh, other nations when our interests are impacted by maritime accidents. An example would be the Costa Concordia. Uh, two US citizens passed away in that accident. So uh, the NTSB was uh, working with the Coast Guard to represent US interests uh, with the Italian government. So an accident investigation, we make findings. We determine the probable cause. 
and like I said, we make recommendations. So what is a major marine casualty? Well, it's defined in statute and regulation as a loss of a self-propelled vessel over 100 gross tons, about 75 feet in length, more or less. Damage estimated at $500,000 or more. And if anyone knows what that means, it's a paint scratch nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of small re uh, recreational vessels that reach that threshold pretty quickly. The loss of six or more lives, a serious threat to life, property, or the environment. Accidents, like I said, involving U.S. government vessels, and that includes the Navy, Coast Guard, Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA, Customs Border Patrol, uh, anyone that, any U.S. government agency that operates a vessel. And like I said, we do provide technical assistance when the U.S. has declared a substantial interest of state in another maritime casualty anywhere in the world. And we also do multimodal investigations, and we're one of the modes that uh, we end up striking bridges and hitting railroad bridges, highway bridges. Last Friday in Corpus Christi, you may have seen on the news a serious accident that killed four crew members and injured six others when a dredge struck a pipeline in the harbor of Corpus Christi. So we're doing a multimodal investigation with the Office of Marine Safety and the Office of Rail Pipeline Hazmat. Uh, so that's another type of accident investigation we do. So the accidents take many different formats. Like I said, they hit bridges. Uh, one of the more serious accidents we investigated was an Amtrak bridge accident. We call the Sunset Limited. Uh, the train was on its way to Alabama, I believe, and the a tug and barge had struck the bridge and moved the rails just enough to derail the the train, Amtrak train that went across the bridge, and uh, that change led to training, important training for Merchant Marine Officers and Radar Observer. Some accidents are more common than others. Uh, we have a lot of tug, tugboat accidents where they sink at the, uh, in various conditions. And a lot of fires. Uh, this one is a vessel that completely burned up, as you can tell. Uh, we investigate accidents on fishing vessels, towing vessels, cargo ships, tankers, passenger vessels, any US flag casualty or any casualty within our 12 mile limit. And that includes US territories. Oftentimes there isn't much left to examine or uh, to collect. As you can see this, this photograph uh, inside a vessel completely burned out. So ex experienced investigators need to look for certain clues. Uh, in our laboratories we have fire investigators which help the marine staff. Uh, also material laboratory which helps look at material failures. Oftentimes our investigators need to wait until a response is over with, uh, until the spill or has materials been cleaned up, which can delay an investigation for days in some, in some cases. So our more landmark NTSB investigations, of course the Exxon Valdez. Uh, this occurred early in my career. I graduated in 1987 and I was working on tankers at the time. So early on, the Exxon Valdez was a very important accident that led to major legislation. And uh, our accident report highlighted issues of crew fatigue, uh, vessel traffic service improvements, post-accident substance testing, spill response, and many, many more. I mentioned the Sunset Limited Amtrak accident. In uh, 2003, just after I joined the board, uh, a few weeks after I joined, I was in a training sa uh, session and the Staten Island Ferry, the first accident occurred when the uh, Andrew J. Barberi struck the dock in Staten Island and killed 11 people and injured approximately seven, 70 other people very seriously. And that was uh, my first accident investigation. That led to new requirements for uh, examination of merchant mariners and their fitness qualifications, a whole new set of paperwork for crew members and their doctors to fill out to make sure that they were physically qualified to be a merchant mariner. Also important changes to safety management systems on board US ships. And finally, the accident we'll talk about tonight, uh, the Alfaro is one of the few accidents since the Marine Electric with a very high loss of life. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's a very important development in the merchant marine. It led to a large number of uh, recommendations and findings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But the recommendations covered uh, forecasting improvements, updates to vessel survival craft, and uh, the requirement, hopefully, for personal locator beacons for crew members. So what does an investigation look like? Well, we usually arrive on scene and they're in the middle of a response. So our first job is to coordinate the federal agencies involved and primary, our primary partner is the US Coast Guard. Uh, they work with us on every single maritime casualty and they are a great partner with us. We organize the investigation by conducting an opening meeting and determining who will work with us. Uh, those organizations are called parties. Uh, we brief the families and the media and any concerned stakeholders. Uh, if it's a major accident, we'll have one of those five board members attend with us and they'll serve as the public spokesperson for the investigation in the early stages. Meanwhile, the investigators visit and examine the accident scene and any vessels that were involved. And we do this usually before we start interviewing crew and witnesses. So we have a, a frame of reference. We understand the layout of the vessel and the, the bridge or the engine room. So it's an important first step for us. And as we begin collecting evidence, it might be electronic, it might be documents, photographs, measurements, uh, a survey of the hull, anything uh, along those lines. We uh, will recover the voyage data recorder uh, and other digital evidence. Increasingly voyage data recorders or VDRs are an important part of our investigation. We also may conduct certain testing or research uh, on a particular topic. And then as the investigation proceeds, we'll conduct follow-up visits to the vessel to assess damage. A party to our investigations. First of all, only the NTSB determines who is a party to our investigations. It's not laid out in statute, except we make that determination. So a party is an organization who can provide technical expertise, uh, is usually connected to, directly to the accident. So the Coast Guard is automatically a party. Uh, other relevant government organizations such as NOAA perhaps or the vessel flag state. Vessel owners and operators, of course, manufacturers, classification society, and other organizations who could contribute, pilot associations um, or labor unions, for example. And as the investigation progresses, uh, we work together with the Coast Guard to brief stakeholders. This is Senator Bill Nelson from Florida, uh, providing a briefing to him about the Alfaro accident, uh, which uh, departed Jacksonville, Florida, and impacted a lot of his constituents. So the organization of an investigation begins with the appointment of an investigator in charge. As I mentioned, the board member on scene is the designated spokesperson. Uh, other NTSB functions will attend, sometimes 20 or 30 NTSB personnel will attend an accident. So the Family Assistance Group, TDA, Public Affairs, Government Affairs, each party will appoint a party coordinator to work with the investigator in charge. They'll form a number of groups for different specialties, such as operations, engineering, human factors, survival factors, naval architecture, and so on. Each one of those groups will have an NTSB employee from their Office of Marine Safety and maybe other offices as well. And then each party will assign one person to each group where they can provide expertise. This is a, an example of uh, what it looks like to be an investigator. Uh, the, if you can look on the right side of the photograph there, a person wiping his brow, that's myself. Um, uh, there's a lot of folks here in lower Manhattan. You see the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. This followed a, a serious accident and uh, when a passenger vessel struck a dock, injuring a lot of citizens uh, on board. If standing to my left is the uh, current, now the current chairman, and, uh, and he's briefing the press on the first day of the accident. So behind the scenes, this is what uh, we do. We work in groups. Uh, we work briefing each other. The investigations will go sometimes 14, 16 hours a day. 
primarily in the uh, in the afternoon or in the morning we'll be out in the field interviewing witnesses and the evening we'll get back together and right, do together on the progress and uh, slides that I normally show I and mean, he's just speaking to like 100 people plan for other other activities for the next day so uh, we'll make uh, visits to the vessel uh, this is a vessel that struck a, a bridge in, in Oakland, the Costco Busan. Uh, in the case of the duck accident, if you remember a few years ago, the, uh, the duck uh, in Branson, Missouri, a tragic accident where some passengers died uh, after the vessel took on water in a thunderstorm. Sometimes you need to get out on a boat to where the vessel is anchored offshore. So uh, we, we ask uh, like the Coast Guard to give us a help and get us offshore. We'll start collecting evidence. Uh, this was an investigation we did on parasailing. Uh, we collected the harnesses of some various accidents, brought them back to our laboratory for examination. We have a laboratory with an electron microscope and some other equipment back in our Washington DC headquarters. We'll uh, download uh, information from the Voyage Data Recorder uh, and sometimes the recorders have a separate capsule. Other times you have to nice. connect directly to the cabinet. Pretty much pictures. We'll go uh, top to bottom from the top of the ship to the bottom and do a survey internally and externally. We'll test engine controls. Take that picture. And uh, some people on, on, the, on the call may recognize this individual. Uh, we have a naval architect on, on staff and he helps uh, con conduct stability uh, calculations and collecting documents on board the ship. Doing uh, engine control tests, sometimes we'll interview a witness or a crew member to step the process of okay. create the accident. We'll check out all the engine machinery, make sure it's operating correctly. And sometimes we'll do follow-up visits. Uh, this is myself on a shipyard visit surveying the damage. Sometimes damage can't be seen uh, from a simple dock side. It, you have to wait till the ship goes in the dry dock to visibly examine damage. So after we collect all the information, there may be a hearing. The Coast Guard also may hold a hearing. We'll con each group chairman will compile a, compile a factual report. And then each party reviews those factual reports. That's called a technical review. And so that everyone basically is working on the same set of facts. And uh, a draft report is compiled with our analysis. Each party then provides us with their analysis. That's called a party submission. And then finally, an office report is drafted and submitted for approval by the board itself. And it goes through many peer review processes in the, in the, in the approximately one to two years, uh, depending on the size of the investigation. Typically, we have two major products in our office. We have something called an accident brief, and these are small accidents, usually with one issue. Uh, they do not have safety recommendations. Uh, they are issued by the office director uh, by delegated authority. Unless a public vessel is involved, in which case the board will adopt those products. Um, a full marine accident report, like the Alfaro we'll discuss tonight, might be 100 pages long with exhibits. Uh, also accompanied by a public docket, which is all the supporting documentation. These are adopted by the board and sometimes involve a public meeting and usually include safety recommendations. The office also puts out a Safer Seas Digest, an annual uh, from the previous calendar year of all of our products. It's a uh, highly, pro highly polished uh, production. Our uh, report development staff do a great job of, of creating a usable publication. Uh, a lot of operators use these for training purposes, uh, put it on the chart table. Uh, we provide these to organizations and it's a really good product, a lot of good feedback. Uh, our 2019 product is due here in the next few months. We also do special investigative reports. Like I mentioned, we did a report on parasailing uh, because it falls somewhere in between the FAA and the Coast Guard. We did a report on congested waterways. And uh, we also work with our research laboratory on safety studies. 
vessel traffic system, we did an examination of all 12 VTS stations around the country and put out a report with several recommendations to make improvements uh, to that Coast Guard operated system. We also on occasion will put out a safety alert. Uh, the last one we did was about vessel icing, uh, up, particularly up in the Bering Sea. As you know, a lot of fishing boats operate up there and, and uh, they're susceptible in certain meteorological conditions to uh, icing, which can accumulate on the rigging and basically uh, sink a vessel very quickly. And on occasion, we've also created safety videos. I think uh, Liz may have uh, provided some previous information to the participants tonight. Uh, we did one on the Alfaro investigation, uh, which was accompanied by a really well-produced 16-page uh, illustrated digest. Right now, we have, we have about a 50 open investigations. Like I said, it takes about a year to complete. Uh, some take a little longer. We have a, a new uh, case management system that we're, we're implementing, uh, which allows us to track acts investigations as they proceed and also um, collect all of our documentation within one, one application. Uh, we have a deep draft report, which will be out later this year. Uh, we have an accident report coming out very soon on the USS Fitzgerald collision with a container ship. Uh, that's expected very, very shortly. Uh, in April, we, we have the Stretch Duck 7 Branson report, which uh, again, I mentioned earlier. It was the first virtual board meeting. Uh, now that we're in the COVID situation, the board had a virtual board meeting, first of its kind, uh, about the Stretch Duck 7 accident. We're also uh, nearing completion of the serious dive boat accident uh, off California last year. We expect that will be uh, published in the fall. Um, and as you can see, many other accidents that we're handling right now. We also do a training course, uh, which will be held next week for investigative agencies and companies and Coast Guard that work with us to give them a, a, a serious training on how we do business. And we also have a standing workshop, uh, which passes on lessons we learned from the voyage data recovery of the Alfaro. So like I said, sometimes we hold workshops. Uh, this is some of our staff uh, at a workshop we held last year on accident investigations at the seafloor. And uh, we do that at our Ashburn facility out in Virginia. So with that, I'll start our discussion on the Alfaro. Uh, like, like Liz said, it's a very serious accident occurred in 2015. The Alfaro was built in 1975, and it was a steam turbine ship. It was built specifically for the Puerto Rico trade, and was on that route for about 15 years. It's known as a roll-on, roll-off ship carrying vehicles and other cargo. The vessel was originally built uh, 700 feet long, and then was extended 90 feet in 1993. During the investigation, we identified numerous safety issues. The report was approximately 200 pages long and had 62 safety recommendations and over 90 findings, one of the largest investigations of its kind. Uh, loss of propulsion, uh, the ship steam turbine lost propulsion uh, at sea in a hurricane, uh, which began the, the fatal sequence. There was flooding in cargo holds, uh, down flooding through ventilation closures. There was, uh, when we examined the da damage control plans for the vessel, there was some requirements that needed to be put in place. The survival craft, the ship was built, like I said in the, earlier on, uh, 30 years ago, and still had open life lifeboats. Uh, and they were never renewed to a more modern covered lifeboat. Uh, there was also a late decision by the master to muster the crew, although we don't think it really made much difference given the weather conditions. There was obviously in inadequate company oversight and their safety management system, ineffective bridge resource management. The weather information, we determined that there was sufficient weather information on board the ship uh, to avoid the accident. However, we did find that there were some improvements that we made and I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Obviously, the captain's actions going into a hurricane. 
uh, something called the Alternative Compliance Program, which allowed the American Bureau of Shipping to do a lot of the functions of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we, we looked at that program in detail. Uh, the voyage data recorders and the quality of information we recovered, uh, there was a lot of audio uh, difficulties, and so we recommended some improvements in that area. The use, expanded use of AIS to disseminate and collect weather information and the use of personal locator beacons, which the crew members did not have. The NTSB put out five products uh, in support of this investigation. The first was a tropical cyclone information for mariners. This was a, a recommendation focused on the quality of the weather forecasting of tropical cyclones at sea. We covered a wide variety of, of topics. Uh, including the quality of forecasting modeling, the uh, dissemination of weather it's to, to mariners, and a lot of um, recommendations in that, in that regard. Then there was, of course, the main report, the Sink of the Alfaro Marine Accident Report. We put out a companion video with an illustrated digest, and like I said, we had over 90 findings and 62 safety recommendations. So, this is the El Faro uh, in the years before the accident. As you can see, there's containers in the upper deck. And you also see that the, below the upper deck there, there are some, there's a hangar deck, if you will. There's a, a deck there that's open to the weather uh, where vehicles are, are stowed and uh, there's other tanks with uh, other products. And then below there, those decks are vehicles in uh, cargo holds. This is another view of the ship. So going back to October 1st of 2015, uh, approximately a week before this happened, the, the director of marine safety had left the agency and the de deputy director became the acting director and I was the chief of investigations. We received a phone call from the Coast Guard that a large U.S. commercial ship was missing in Hurricane Joaquin. And uh, everyone presumed that they were having difficulties with communication. Perhaps the antennas had sustained damage during the hurricane and they would monitor and keep us informed of any developments. But at that, at that point, the chance of a major accident was fairly low in our opinion. Uh, There's a ship with a lot of different forms of communication on board. So we were you know, we were concerned, but we weren't too worried about what the uh, outcome would be at that point. Um, then later we heard from the Coast Guard that there had been communication with the company uh, via phone call, and that there was some added level of concern that they had lost power. And now the Coast Guard, of course, deployed as many resources as possible, but there was still an active hurricane. Uh, they deployed many assets, as you can see in this slide, to uh, search for the El Faro. And days later, the accident was declared a casualty. They found wreckage and oil spill, approximately where the ship was uh, eventually found in 15,000 feet of water. But that day when they declared a casualty, at the end of that day, uh, the Coast Guard ended, suspended their search and rescue efforts and turned their attention to an accident investigation. Our board member, Bella Denzar was the board member. We dispatched to the scene with a full team. And uh, this is the beginning of the investigation. As I mentioned, we dispatched a full team. They immediately went to examine a sister vessel, the El Yunque. Uh, that was so we could familiarize ourselves with the nomenclature of the ship and the layout. Again, looking at particular machinery uh, that might be of interest to us. Uh, on the investigation. Doing an investigation where there is no wreckage, there's no survivors, and there is no other evidence uh, except a short phone call from the captain indicating that they had lost power and they were listing badly and that they had taken some flooding. They believe they had the flooding under control. And that's really about all we had. Uh, a short phone call and voice, voicemail left for one of the company officials. So we didn't have much to go on. We had to start from scratch. So now I'm gonna play a short video. Uh, this is a presentation that was provided 
to the board in our public meeting in December of 2017. And we'll play it now. The 40-year-old U.S. flag steam-powered cargo ship El Faro was owned by Tote Maritime Puerto Rico and operated by Tote Services Incorporated. The vessel was engaged in weekly service between Jacksonville, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico and typically followed a course traveling to the east of the Bahama Islands. The vessel sank on October 1, 2015 in Hurricane Joaquin, a Category 3 hurricane. At 9.48 Eastern Daylight Time on the evening of September 29th, El Faro departed Jacksonville loaded with containers and vehicles. The ship was bound for San Juan with a crew of 33. Two days before El Faro left on the accident voyage, the storm that became Hurricane Joaquin was a tropical depression about 360 nautical miles northeast of San Salvador Island, Bahamas. The system was upgraded to Tropical Storm Joaquin at 10.36 the evening of September 28th. Hurricane Joaquin was consistently predicted to move southwest, then turn north. But the storm continued to move in a more southerly direction. Its intensity grew to a higher level and faster than predicted. On August 8, 2016, about 10 months after the vessel sank, El Faro's Voyage Data Recorder, or VDR, was recovered. It lay under more than 15,000 feet of water. The VDR recorded the last 26 hours of conversation on the bridge, as well as vessel operating data. The VDR recording began at 5.36 in the morning on September 30th. The vessel was traveling at about 20 knots. Just after 6 a.m. on September 30th, a Bon Voyage system, or BVS, weather package was downloaded on a computer in the captain's office. The BVS weather package had been sent about one hour earlier. BVS is a desktop application provided by a private company, Applied Weather Technology. The BVS package showed the predicted storm track, weather, and sea state information in graphic form. BVS tropical cyclone position and intensity information sent to El Faro during the accident voyage was typically six hours behind the current National Hurricane Center information. According to the BVS package sent at 5 a.m., storm winds were 55 knots sustained. Aboard El Faro, BVS weather packages were sent only to the captain's email address, but he could forward them to a computer on the bridge where the information would have been available to other crew members. After reviewing the 5 a.m. BVS weather information with the chief mate, the captain ordered a course change of 10 degrees to the south to put distance between the ship and the approaching storm. About 15 minutes later, El Faro received the National Hurricane Center storm advisory on the SAT-C printer on the bridge. This unscheduled advisory contained a minor correction to the normally scheduled advisory that had been sent about two hours before. SAT-C is an automated satellite system that transmits weather advisories to vessels of all types. SAT-C data is only provided in a text format. This report indicated similar intensities to the 5 a.m. BVS package. Sustained winds were 60 knots, gusting to 75 knots. Throughout this presentation, the position of the storm will be interpolated along each predicted BVS or SAT-C track in order to show where the storm would have been expected to be at any specific time. The position of the storm along the National Hurricane Center's best track or actual track will be shown in black. This storm track was calculated after the accident. The National Hurricane Center identified the storm as a hurricane at 7.39 a.m. on September 30th. It was then centered about 135 nautical miles east-northeast of San Salvador Island. During the noon to four watch on September 30th, the VDR recorded Coast Guard aircraft broadcasting two warnings to mariners about the hurricane. Later that afternoon, after hearing several discussions about the weather, the helmsman asked the captain if he was going to turn around. The captain said no. Just before 5 p.m., the ship received a sat sea weather report that sustained winds had increased to 75 knots, gusting to 90 knots. The BVS weather package sent to the captain's email address at 5 p.m. and downloaded about an hour later showed slightly less intense conditions. About 7 p.m., the captain ordered a course change of 10 degrees farther to the south to put more distance between the ship and the storm. The vessel's track would shift to pass between San Salvador Island and Rum Key and then turned to pass to the north of Samanaki. 
After 7.57 p.m. on September 30th, the captain left the bridge and was not heard again on the VDR recording until 4.09 the next morning. Just before 11 p.m., the bridge received a Sat C advisory that the storm's sustained winds were 100 knots, gusting to 120 knots. Joaquin was now a Category 3 hurricane. At 11 p.m., a BVS weather package was sent to the captain's computer. It was not downloaded until 4.45 the next morning. After reviewing the updated Sat C weather report at 11 p.m., the third mate called the captain. He told the captain that on its current track, the vessel would meet the storm at 4 o'clock the next morning. The VDR only recorded audio from the bridge and did not capture the captain's side of the conversation. About 10 minutes later, the third mate called the captain back and said they would be 22 miles from the center of the storm at 4 a.m. and suggested altering their course to head south at 2 a.m. However, this suggested course change was not implemented. At the midnight watch turnover, the third mate told the second mate that they were receiving different information from different weather sources. The second mate reviewed the weather forecast and began looking at the charts for a course to avoid the storm. At 1.20 a.m. on October 1st, after hearing a satellite radio report that the storm was strengthening, the second mate called the captain and suggested a course change at 2 a.m. toward Old Bahama Channel, which runs north of Cuba. The captain did not agree with the second mate's suggestion. The second mate said the captain's orders were to run with the original course. This course put them directly into the forecasted path of the hurricane. Throughout the second mate's midnight to four watch, the weather deteriorated rapidly. The ship began listing to starboard because of the strong winds on the port side, and the vessel was losing speed as it approached the outer bands of the storm. Due to the starboard list and worsening conditions, seawater entered into the partially enclosed second deck of the cargo area through cargo loading and other openings in the hull. Toward the end of the watch, the vessel was unable to maintain its heading using the autopilot system because of the wind and the high seas. At 4.09 a.m., the captain returned to the bridge. He and the crew talked about the weather and the loss of ship speed. Despite the worsening weather, the captain said several times that they would be ahead of the storm. He thought they were on the better side of it, meaning the less dangerous quadrant. The captain was most likely relying on the BVS graphical weather package sent at 5 p.m. the evening before. He had not downloaded the most recent BVS package. Statements on the bridge indicated that the ship was listening to the starboard side, due in part to the strengthening winds on the port side. About 4.40 a.m., the chief engineer called the bridge and said the starboard list was affecting the oil levels in the sumps of engine room machinery. At 4.45 a.m., the captain downloaded the BVS weather package that had been sent about 11 o'clock the night before. By the time the captain downloaded it, the storm's position and intensity data in the BVS package were 12 hours behind the National Hurricane Center's current information. About the same time, a National Hurricane Center advisory arrived on the bridge via Sat C. The hurricane was centered about 17 nautical miles north of Samana Key. Maximum sustained winds were 105 knots, gusting to 130 knots. The chief mate mentioned a list of possibly 18 degrees while the captain discussed how oil levels in the engine room were affected by the list with the engineer who was aboard to supervise the riding gang. At 5.43, the bridge received a phone call that there was water in the number three cargo hold. The crew thought that the water was possibly coming from a small open hatch called a scuttle on the second deck. A minute later, the captain said cars were loose. He was likely referring to cars in the lower level of the number three cargo hold. The captain verified that bilge pumps were running to remove the water in three hold, and he directed the engineers to pump ballast water from a starboard to a port tank to improve the list. The captain and chief engineer spoke on the phone about the water level rising in the cargo hold and the effects of the list. After speaking to the chief engineer, the captain ordered the ship to be turned to port to put the wind on the starboard side of the vessel and create a port list. As the ship was turned to port, the chief mate reported that the hold was flooded on the starboard side. Within two minutes, the ship's significant starboard list shifted to a significant port list. After the ship was listing to the port side, the captain ordered the engineers to stop transferring ballast. The chief mate accessed the scuttle, reporting that water had been knee deep and pouring over the scuttle, and then closed it. After the turn to port, the crew on the bridge noticed that the ship was losing speed. 
Shortly after 6 a.m., El Faro lost propulsion and the vessel could no longer maneuver. At 7.06 a.m., the captain spoke with Tote's designated person to advise him of the situation. He reported that there was a considerable amount of water in threehold. They had lost propulsion due to a loss of lube oil pressure. The list was about 15 degrees and the weather was ferocious. Afterwards, the captain told the second mate to send a distress message. At 7.15 a.m., the chief mate reported that the chief engineer said a fire main was ruptured, likely meaning that there was a damaged seawater pipe in threehold, allowing seawater to rush into the cargo hold. The chief mate reported that cars were floating in the number three cargo hold, and a bilge alarm alerted the crew that water began entering another cargo hold. Although the crew had closed the scuttle and were pumping out the space, water was still entering the cargo hold faster than the bilge pumps could remove it. At 7.27 a.m., the captain ordered the emergency signal to be sounded over the general alarm system, and two minutes later, the captain ordered the abandoned ship signal to be sounded. The VDR recording ended at 7.39 a.m. while the captain tried to help the helmsman escape the ship's bridge. Okay, so this is uh, just a few slides here to talk about. Um, this is the, what the BVS package, the uh, commercial program, Bon Voyage system that this is what the captain uh, was being sent uh, on his computer there. And it's a, a more uh, visually appealing graphical representation of the weather forecast. And then on the, on the right side, you'll see that uh, this is what the satellites see. It's a text, text heavy where the, the deck officer, someone's gonna have to plot this the positions on the chart. So we, we saw this presentation here. Here's a nautical chart of the area. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, this location. And you can see where uh, this is a simulation we conducted when we took the weather information and the ship's heel and we conducted a simulation with a program called OrcaFlex. A lot of work by our naval architect and our uh, friends at the Coast Guard to try to figure out what the ship's actions look like uh, to possibly recreate the conditions and the effect on the ship's uh, heel and roll. So we used, you know, a lot of technology in this investigation and, and uh, unfortunately we didn't have the exact weather conditions. So we had to basically estimate the uh, conditions at the time because we were short of any weather information for that particular location. So this is the access uh, hatch you they were talking about in that hangar deck or the uh, auto deck that's you can see is open to the weather. Uh, and so water was coming into this upper deck there and then going down this, this scuttle into the lower cargo hole. And you can see there where the boarding seas were entering. And uh, this second deck was the water type, the uh, red line there. So the water was entering and going down into the lower cargo hold here where vehicles were stored, and you can see where the uh, vessels were chained to the deck, but the way they were chained was really inadequate for hurricane conditions. And as water increased, uh, the vehicles began to move. Uh, the presentation also talked about the, when the ship took a port list, the lub lub lubrication oil in the main steam turbine uh, the began uh, sucking air essentially in the bell mouth and losing suction. And when that happens, there's a system that shuts down the steam turbine so that the steam turbine doesn't operate without lubrication. And that's what happened. As soon as they went to port, the lubrication uh, stopped the main turbine. And as a result, uh, they couldn't pump the water out and the list to port continued as water went into the number three cargo hold. The water initially came, we believe, through the fire pump uh, when a vehicle struck the fire pump. And then as the vessel got deeper, uh, water began entering through these exhausts, uh, through these vents into the cargo holds, causing eventual flooding. And you can see here where, where the water is coming in and creating a list.
this is a diagram of number three hole and a photograph of that fire pump. We believe that a vehicle struck uh, that fire pump, which was not protected. Uh, this is a sister vessel. So we believe that the fire pump was sheared and there was basically a, a, a water main from the ocean directly into the cargo hold unabated. Also mentioned, this is a photograph of the survival craft, the open lifeboat. There were two of these on board. Uh, we did recover one on the surface and one was found at the seafloor. Uh, it doesn't appear as if they were successfully launched. Um, also the life rafts in those conditions uh, and hurricane force winds, once they deploy, very likely blew away and very uh, slim chance of getting into them from a ship uh, healing over 15, 18 degrees. Once the, the casualty occurred and we began the investigation, uh, we knew there was no wreckage and no survivors. It was important for us to find the voyage data recorder. So while we sent the investigation team down to Jacksonville, Florida, we also contacted the US Navy and the supervisor of salvage and diving or called SoupSal. And we asked them to get out to the site as quickly as possible. One of the limiting factors we needed to get out on scene as quickly as possible was the voyage data recorder had a acoustic pinger and we were told that the battery would last about 30 days once immersed in water. Uh, eventually we found out that the battery probably never operated because it was expired. Another oversight by um, perhaps the crew or the uh, people inspecting the radio equipment. Uh, this is what the back deck looked like uh, before the, the Navy left. Uh, this is from Little Creek, Virginia, uh, where the Navy SEALs are and the Navy Soup South have their equipment. As you can see, the entire back deck of the Apache is filled with uh, containers to operate the uh, equipment. The first uh, equipment deployed on site once the vessel got down to the Bahamas was this towed, uh, towed painter locator, TPL. And they towed that for several days, listening for the voyage data recorder. Uh, you had to float that little uh, wing device very low to the uh, seafloor because it only had a, about a one mile range on that pinger. So you had to lower this very low down in the water. Like I said, we never heard the, the acoustic pinger. So once they arrived on site and they did not hear the VDR pinger, they deployed a single uh, sideband sonar, excuse me, uh, side scan sonar, towed in this Orion uh, sled. And they towed this around for several days to locate the vessel. And this is what it looks like off the stern doing some testing. So they towed for a day or two and they came across at the position where the oil spill was reported and you can see in the upper right hand corner the uh, image of the Alfaro. This is an acoustic image from the side scan sonar at approximately 15,000 feet laying on its side. So the Navy then deployed the curve, the cabled underwater uh, remote vehicle uh, from the Apache. This is what it looks like close up. It's a cable or ROV, a remote operated vehicle, which means there's a a tether from the ship to the vehicle, providing power and electricity and also receiving data from the cameras. This photograph here, as you can see all the various equipment on the right side of the screen, there's a white mast, a white pole with a red object on the end of it. Uh, that was the uh, ultra short baseline navigation system for the curve. Um, this is how the curve navigates underwater. And uh, as you can see here on November 1st, uh, the curve went down to the Alfaro and confirmed that this was the shipwreck we were investigating. And uh, that really the investigation really could begin at this point. Uh, we began surveying the vessel. Of course, the one thing we're looking for is that voyage data recorder. So and this is a view from the cameras at the front of the ROV as they approach the, the, the deck, uh, the navigation wheelhouse of the El Faro. And we expected the VDR to be at the base of the mast on a frame on top of this pilot house. 
unfortunately, the masts have been ripped free. Uh, this is a up close photograph of where the masts have been welded to the deck. And so essentially our first attempt to find the voyage data recorder that was mounted to the base of the mast, uh, we found that the, basically the mast was missing and uh, so was the VDR. And so that voyage came to an end. We continued surveying the seafloor for other information and we came back to headquarters began reviewing the video and looking at the seafloor and making a determination if the second mission to find the VDR would be successful. Unfortunately, the Navy couldn't help us. They said, you know, if you can find it with other assets, uh, we'll, we'll help you go retrieve the VDR if necessary. So the, our good friends at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution down the road from you folks at the Marconi Museum, the US Navy, the National Science Foundation, and the University of Rhode Island helped us with the next mission. We put together, we reviewed the survey information from the first mission, and we created our research engineering laboratory, create a, a, a search probability box to help narrow down this, the proposed search area for a second mission. So the second mission, we used the Atlantis, which is a station there in Woods Hole, Massachusetts and the, uh, it's operated by the National Science Foundation. We uh, loaded up the Sentry, which is a, an early autonomous underwater vehicle or AUV. Looks like a big guppy, um, but it's autonomous. So once they put it in the water, they release it. And a set program, it can carry, it go all the way down to the seafloor at 6,000 meters. And it does one of two functions. It either does sonar surveys or photography. And so, once the vessel does a sonar survey, they bring it back to the vessel and they change the battery, charge the batteries, and then replace the sonar trays with cameras. We had one of our staff on board. They also had something called the Alvin Observation Vehicle. If you know anything about the Atlantis, it's the host of the US uh, manned uh, submarine, the Alvin. And, uh, this is an apparatus that Woods Hole's created to, in case Alvin has a problem at the seafloor, they can deploy this to help uh, free it or, or troubleshoot the situation. So we repurposed this AOV. It's a large, looks like a large phone booth and it's bristling with cameras and sensors. Uh, we added light uh, source at 15,000 feet. We needed to add a lot of video cameras and light sources. And it also is, has some control you can actually uh, there's some hydraulics that allow the operators to control that AOV. One of the problems in the first mission with the Navy was communication and also keeping the stakeholders back in Washington uh, apprised of what was going on. So we, we worked with the University of Rhode Island in uh, Newport there to help us with something called telepresence, something they were working with NOAA to facilitate uh, a live link from the seafloor to the ship all the way back to our headquarters. It allowed us H, uh, high definition video within a, like a one or two second delay. Uh, very expensive, uh, but it was a great apparatus for us. It provided a number of backup features of uh, high data transfer and uh, live video and also ship to shore communications in real time. So one of the first things that the Atlantis did on scene uh, they did a multi-beam sonar survey of the seafloor and the wreck itself to try to find observed objects that may be of interest that might fit the description of the mast and hopefully the voyage data recorder. The, the Alvin, not the Alvin, but the, uh, the Sentry, which was the guppy looking device I showed you earlier. These are photographs and a mosaic of all the photographs that were being taken close-ups of the, the vessel itself. And you can see a lot of the damage that was done to the ship as it was rolling over and uh, sinking. We also found the second lifeboat. As we got a little closer, you can see that reflected tape and uh, that was in very, very bad shape after uh, being battered at the surface. You can see that the boat itself is broken. Also, we looked at the cargo holds. We were looking for any sign where the vessel may have had a fracture or anything that was 
may have occurred at the surface. Uh, we're looking again, keeping our mind open. Uh, we have not recovered the VDR at this point. We are taking high quality photographs of the vessel. This is a mosaic of the bridge. And you can see with a lot of, a lot of high, high quality, good lighting, uh, a good photograph of the bridge of the El Faro. And you can see where the mast uh, was, should have been welded to the deck on, up on top of the flying bridge. We also equipped the mission with some uh, new radar, uh, sonar, excuse me. Uh, this is an 850 kilohertz radar signature of a, of a uh, hand railing that was found on the seafloor. That's actually a sonar image, it's not a photograph. And this is the object that, that, was, uh, that we were just looking at. So you can see the, photo, the sonar image and then this is the railing that, uh, in the photograph. So very high quality sonar. That sonar, however, need to be very close to the seafloor in order to be effective. But we were using that to help find that coffee can size voyage data recorder. We needed really high resolution. On April 26, uh, towards the end of the mission, uh, this photograph is found approximately two in the morning. Uh, and you can see the foot of the mast there with an object. And this is a close up here, a color image of the voyage down recorder entangled at the foot of the mast. Uh, received a phone call about six in the morning from uh, the team at the headquarters that told me that they'd found the recorder. And uh, we've been holding our breath for a long time that we had spent a lot of money looking for this. And we were hoping that we would find it. And then we did find it. Uh, now the, the next challenge was getting it to the surface. And we, we talked with the folks on board and we evaluated the situation. We found that we didn't have the proper equipment on board the ship to possibly lift that uh, 20 ton mast uh, to free the Voyage Data Recorder. And we decided that we would wait until we returned with the Navy and uh, have the proper equipment to uh, recover the VDR. So going back to that, prediction, that high probability search zone. And you can see that uh, it pretty much predicted where the Voyage Data Recorder would be in relation to the main wreck. And that high probability search zone was determined by, uh, you know, looking at the density of the object and, and how things drift in the water column. And I would say that our research engineering department did a pretty good job of predicting where the VDR might be. So we left this, the Voyage Data Recorder at the seafloor and we uh, continued doing a survey. One of the things we had a problem with, with uh, vehicles in the vicinity of the wreck was the mooring lines were floating, creating hazards for the uh, investigative uh, vehicles, the RODs. So we knew we would hopefully come back with the Navy. So we did a little, uh, some diagrams of where these potential hazards were. Operating an ROV at 15,000 feet, you don't want to get entangled with uh, a mooring line. And furthermore, uh, the Navy was going to hold us uh, financially responsible for their ROV. So it was very high importance to make sure we didn't uh, damage their equipment. So in August, uh, a vessel came available and the Navy was available to go back out and recover the Voyage Data Recorder. We deployed a team of NTSB and uh, US Coast Guard, set, set sail on the original ship, the Apache. and. We recovered after a 10 month effort. Uh, this is the photograph of the ROV snatching the Voyage Data Recorder from the seafloor. Again, 15,000 feet, there are very few vehicles that can operate at that depth. And uh, we we're very fortunate that the Navy helped us uh, do this. This is the photograph of the VDR coming to the surface and recovered by our staff on board. It was examined uh, just to give our laboratory a heads up on the physical condition or any type of examination that might be required. Also, we, it was important to depressurize the canister since we were going to fly it back to, from Florida back to headquarters. And uh, so we had to depressurize the canister. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any human remains, but we were uh, able, we did have some facilities on board to, in the event we did find human remains. Uh, that was uh, never the case in this particular accident. Uh, there was a lot of public interest. This is uh, the staff of 60 Minutes and Scott Pelley there. Uh, 60 Minutes and CBS did two segments on this accident and you can find them 
uh, the CBS website. This uh, image here was taken, uh, an amalgamation of a lot of data with both sonar and uh, multi-beam, side scan and photographs, and they were put together by our graphics team back at headquarters. This is a very realistic rendition of how the ship looks at the seafloor. As you can see, the mooring lines and the truck extending out of the starboard side, just as it was found. And here's another view. Uh, again, this is helps, uh, because of the photography is very murky and you have to get really close up to an object, this really helps bring the subject to a scale you can appreciate. So the agency came up with this probable cause statement uh, determining uh, what was responsible for the loss of the El Faro. Primarily the captain's insufficient action to avoid the hurricane and his failure to use the most current weather information and his late decision to muster the crew. Bridge resource management, as I mentioned, was an, uh, and also the adequacy of totes oversight other contributing factors was the flooding in the cargo hold from the undetected water, open water tight scuttle, and of course the damaged seawater piping to the fire main. That led to the loss of uh, lube oil pressure to the main turbine and the prolonged list and subsequent down flooding. Also the lack of an approved damage control plan to help uh, control the list in that circumstance. And finally, the loss of life was uh, contributed to by the lack of an appropriate survival craft for the conditions. A number of recommendations came out of this case. Like I said, approximately uh, 60 recommendations altogether from the two main products. Uh, the first one is uh, we looked at the National Weather Service forecasting. Uh, again, we determined that the ship had the adequate information on board, but our meteorolog meteorology department looked very carefully at all the information that was provided and we made some suggestions to uh, improve the forecasting of particularly tropical cyclones. And also to uh, disseminate that information through the Inmarsat Sea Safety Net. Also, we found that there was a need for the NOAA to solicit feedback from mariners to make sure that they were receiving weather, weather broadcasts and the quality of those broadcasts to create a feedback loop uh, for mariners to give the National Weather Service some ideas on how to improve their products. Uh, we, uh, we looked at the circumstances of the crew members getting into the survival craft and the very difficult circumstances they were in, very likely if they ended up in the water uh, in survival suits, it would be very difficult to find them. So we recommended to the Coast Guard that crew members on ocean, Great Lakes and near coastal service be issued personal locator beacons. And this is also to help search and rescue. If you see a cluster of, of, of beacons that are going off, you might deploy your search and rescue assets and also help the search and rescuers determine set and drift. So there's a number of reasons that we believe they're reasonably priced now and accessible to um, equip a large number of mariners. We also looked at the use of um, gathering weather information from ships at sea. Uh, the weather service told us that one of the problems they had forecasting was that there's a lack of data from the, particularly the South Atlantic regions where a lot of hurricanes uh, in, over in Africa where they originate, uh, they need a lot more data. And so we, we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Coast Guard and NOAA to come up with a proposal that they uh, have a pilot program to figure out if they could take a weather package on board the ship and use the existing AIS, um, there's some blank fields in the transmission of AIS signals and they could perhaps substitute certain weather parameters like barometric pressure, temperature, wind and wind direction and transmit that out with AIS in almost real time and then be collected by weather forecasters ashore. And they, they have agreed, they've got a pilot program right now to test that out. And if it's successful, they want to go to the IMO and make that a worldwide uh, recommendation. We also looked at the EPIRBs. Uh, I know this is a radio savvy uh, audience here. Uh, we looked at the type of EPIRB that the ship had, and unfortunately it did not have a, a GPS chip inside of it. And still a lot of ships in service that use the old EPIRB that 
requires a triangulation using Doppler and the 406 megahertz signal. And it really relies on satellites being in the right place at the right time. And now that GPS EPIRBs are available, we ask for the FCC to discontinue licensing the use of, of the old EPIRBs. Also, uh, there's some frequency issues. We went to the FCC and uh, asked them to reserve more, more frequency for the use of uh, data for, again, for weather purposes and this AIS information. Finally, we found a, a problem with uh, the Furuno GMDSS equipment on board. Uh, if many of you are familiar, Furuno is one of the main uh, manufacturers of, of GMDSS equipment worldwide. And we found that when the second mate was, was creating a distress message, normally if she had just hit the distress signal, the GPS in the GMDSS system would have automatically uploaded and been sent with a message. Unfortunately, uh, she was attempting to write a custom message with the circumstances of the, what was going on with the list and the loss of power. And as she was trying to manually put a position in, uh, it overrode the feature of automatically transmitting the the current position. So the ship was approximately maybe 20 or 30 miles away from the original distress signal that we received. So with that, uh, it's 8.15. I'd like to uh, go to the question and answer. And I will uh, stop sharing my screen, Kristen, if you're ready to take over. Thank you, uh, Morgan. Um, that was a fabulous uh, presentation. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, and I think that you, you gave us a great appreciation for the considerable and thorough work that the NTSB and, and partners uh, do to get to the cause of um, these tragedies. Um, so thank you, very helpful. Um, so we do have an opportunity for questions and looks like some folks are, we have a couple already. If, for those folks that don't know, if you hover your mouth, mouse at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q and A uh, icon. You just click on that and type your questions right in the box there. Um, so we'll start with Amy, uh, is interested to know if the NTSB gets involved in piracy attacks on US or other nations vessels. Are piracy. Um, <laughs> so uh, ships are equipped with uh, a system. Uh, it's a ship safety alert system. In addition to all the other transmission systems, most US flag and, and merchant ships around the world, as piracy becomes more prevalent in certain areas, uh, they've installed a ship safety alert system, which is uh, essentially a, a silent alarm. Uh, and the, if the uh, regional communication centers or rescue centers receive that alarm, they'll assume there's a piracy attack. But no, those are security issues and the NTSB will not generally be involved in those situations unless a, uh, perhaps a casualty followed uh, that particular incident. But once something becomes a security uh, situation or even public health, for example, the, the CDC gets involved with public health outbreaks of like norovirus or coronavirus, we don't get involved in that either. Okay, thanks, Morgan. Uh, Amy, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Marcus has a question. This is a good one, um, too. How many of the NTSB recommendations have actually been adopted? And, and there's, it's a two-part. Are the recommendations prioritized? Um, if all recommendations can't be adopted for any reason? Those are great questions. So first, the first part of that is um, creating the recommendation to begin with. After the investigation, our analysis, it's really the team, the uh, NTSB Office of Marine Safety and other stakeholders inside our office. Uh, we look at the circumstances, we look at previous board action, previous recommendations, other legislation that may be in place, uh, what other nations do, um, current practices, best practices. And we look at all of that and we determine you know, what the best approach is. And we make safety recommendations sparingly because they are an official act by the board and we follow up every single recommendation. So once the board adopts a report and the recommendations, they are then sent uh, to the addressee for action. And then another office, 
our safety recommendations and communications office then tracks that correspondence all the way from issuance to completion. And on average, the, the agency has approximately an 80% closure rate, uh, generally speaking. Some recommendations are much bigger and take a lot more time to, to enact, particularly if a, a large rulemaking is, is, in, is in force. So the safety management system requirements on passenger vessels has taken over 10 years to uh, finally get the Coast Guard to do a rulemaking on that. And uh, as far as prioritization, uh, once we issue the recommendation, we follow up on a quarterly basis or so with the recipient to see what progress they're making. And um, on occasion, we will reclassify, for example, if we've sent a uh, recommendation to a recipient and they are working on it, sometimes they come up with an alternative action, something we had not considered. Uh, we may reclassify the recommendation as open, acceptable action, open, alternative action. And then finally, once the uh, recipient has taken action we, we deem to be sufficient, we will then classify as closed, uh, acceptable action, closed, unacceptable action. And certain recommendations take many years to fill. Some can be done very quickly. It just it varies on the on what issue we're talking about. The radio ones will take years because once anything is adopted by the US, it has to go typically to the IMO and to the ITU for any changes uh, on the worldwide level. And oftentimes it can take up to 10 years for that type of change. So I hope that answered your question. Oh, as far as budgetary constraints, um, again, the recipient tells us the reason for why they cannot or can do a particular action. Uh, we, we propose uh, the action and they, they come back and tell us uh, this is too expensive or something along those lines. But we try not to get into the budgetary. We try to make realistic recommendations that can be accomplished and uh, try to be realistic about it. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Uh, here's a question from Jan and Ted. Were there penalties for the owners of the El Faro? Okay, so uh, the NTSB is not a regulatory agency. We're not a um, regulator. In the case of the Alfaro, the Coast Guard also did a report, and their job as a regulator is to look at the safety, like we did, but they also look at other administrative, were, were the U.S. flag rules followed, uh, were, were there any criminal acts, and were any civil penalties needed. In the case of the Alfaro, I believe the Coast Guard did recommend to the Commandant for actions against tote, uh, but again, it's not something that we are interested in or we don't have any influence over. Um, that's the job for regulators. Okay, thank you. Uh, James would like to know, or uh, he says, many contributing factors, ship design, seamanship, looks top heavy. Um, what was the trend been in events in the last 30 years? Well, actually, uh, was one of the concerns of this, the age of the ship, but in, in many ways, the ships built back in those days, uh, they used a lot of steel. Um, and so the age of the ship, you know, we initially looked at the extension when they lengthened the ship 90 feet. Uh, we thought maybe there were some issues there. Um, but as far as ship design, obviously more modern ships, they're using uh, different types of steel, they're using more aluminum. Uh, while the ship looks top heavy uh, with all the hull and the ballast and fuel, which is very at the very bottom of the ship, uh, many ships look top heavy, but matter of fact, the steel is uh, much heavier down below, plus all the ballast and fuel. So that it, it is an optical illusion, it makes it look like a lot of weights on top, but many of those containers are empty, so. Okay, thanks. Um, Tom would like to know were, why weren't any crew members found on the ship? So uh, in our first mission, uh, all three missions we had on, on, in uh, November, April, and then August of 2016, uh, one of the things we were concerned about was, you know, what do we do uh, with potentially finding human remains, which is possible. Uh, we've, we've heard from other investigators on aviation accidents where they have found human remains at that depth. Uh, 
So we were prepared and we told the families that if in the course of looking for the voyage data recorder, uh, we would make every effort to recover remains. Um, however, we did not, we were not, that was not one of our primary missions, but in the course of our action, if we came across, we would make every attempt to recover. Um, why weren't they found? Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the rescue craft were, uh, two of the life rafts were found. The one lifeboat was found badly battered at the, at the surface. One was damaged at the seafloor. The ship was healing over and it was in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, the EPER, there was really very little chance of finding the crew members alive once the ship sank. So yeah, we never found them and that's really unfortunate, but uh, with a hurricane, someone could drift uh, many, many miles away from the original position. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that answered the question. Um, sort of related question um, is, uh, was there a lot of legal actions by families after this accident? Uh, I really don't, um, the legal, uh, we try to stay at arm's distance. We're aware of certain uh, settlements that happen, but uh, we do facilitate the, uh, every time we had a milestone in our investigation, uh, we contact the families and inform them of the progress of the fact we found the voyage data recorder and uh, when we finished transcribing we they didn't get to hear the the recording but we gave them a briefing of what we heard what we heard and the transcript and and then uh, before we every step of the way we keep the families informed and had various webinars one of the issues we had five polish crew members and we had translators helping them understand the polish government assisted us with informing their families. But as far as legal settlements, I'm not, uh, I'm, I really can't talk about it. I don't really know much about it. Okay, thanks. Um, Liz would like to know, what was the reaction to your investigation and recommendations from the public, the families and others? I'm sorry, Liz, uh, repeat. Um, what was the reaction oh. to your investigation and recommendations from the public, the families and others? So I think we had a very favorable response to this particular investigation. Like I said, we had two episodes on 60 Minutes, uh, which brought millions of, of people uh, awareness now of, of what was going on. And uh, so it was one of the largest investigations we've ever done. I think the number, the last number I saw was about $7 million of total uh, cost. Half of that, over half of that was the recovery effort. Um, after 10 months of searching for the recorder, and we've turned the investigation around about a year after that. So it was a very, relatively speaking, really quick investigation. We also had a, a concurrent US Coast Guard investigation at the same time. Uh, I, I think we had a very good working relationship with the families and uh, keeping them briefed every, every step of the way certainly helped. We had a lot of help from Congress, uh, a lot of help from other federal agencies. We couldn't do it alone. Uh, the Coast Guard was a, very instrumental to our success, and uh, so we thank all of them for their hard work. Great. And Peter has a question. This is going on the civil lawsuit um, question again. Related, when there are civil lawsuits related to these types of accidents, is it common for the NTSB to be called in as subject matter experts? So there, there are certain uh, statutory protections uh, our reports uh, are divided more or less into two sections. There is a factual portion and then there, there's our analysis. The factual portion and all the supporting evidence, facts, photographs, documents, that becomes public once we issue our report. Anything that's in that material uh, could be used in court. Uh, any of our analysis uh, internal discussions that's protected and we don't, we won't share that in court. Uh, we have on occasion had NTSB investigators called as witnesses, but they're only commenting on uh, the work that they performed, their, their factual reports. Um, so we really try to stay out as best we can and perhaps do depositions instead of being in court. Uh, on occasion it has happened. Uh, we really try to avoid 
the both civil and, and uh, criminal space as best we can. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question from Tom who says, splendid professional presentation, thank you. Uh, his question is about the El Faro salvage of the voice recorder. Was the heavy mass and recorder raised by an ROV or was it just a three mile long cable? So the recorder, uh, as you saw in the photograph, was, was entangled with the bottom of the mast. And the equipment we had on the second mission was not capable of lifting the mast. Uh, our number one concern was not damaging the recorder in any way. And there were a number of obstructions around the mast. So we needed to make sure that the ROV on the Navy mission that would follow uh, had a very, under, a very good uh, unobstructed path to the ROV, to the recorder. And it turned out that the ROV was able to cut the cables. And so it's just a very small, maybe a 10 foot cable that was wrapped around the mast. And so the ROV just went in with one of its manipulator arms and cut the cable and then grabbed the recorder with the other mechanical arm. And that was all done remotely from that, that, that 15,000 foot cable uh, but the recorder itself was then put into a, a large basket on the front of the ROV. They reached up, grabbed the, the recorder, put it into the basket, closed the basket, and put a pin to make sure that the recorder wouldn't accidentally fall out. Uh, so they secured a pin into the basket and then brought the ROV back to surface. And from that point, we were documenting, we had a videographer to make sure that everyone saw the, the transfer of, of custody from the ROV to the hands of the NTSB and all the way back to our headquarters, we, we kept a video monitor, if you will, um, on that process. We didn't want anyone to say it was a conspiracy. We never recovered it. Uh, we, we took extra pains to recover it and bring it to the surface and bring it to our laboratory. We also had a manufacturer and we also called upon another investigative agency to witness uh, our handling of the voyage data recorder that, you know, in case it came up empty, we wanted to have sort of an impartial witness to, to um, verify that we had done everything properly, so. Well, that was an amazing amount of, of information that was found on that uh, voice data recorder. Is, is that common that it would have that much information? That particular recorder was called a simplified voyage data recorder. It was one of the early, early uh, versions of an uh, early model of a, a VDR. And so it was only required to record a handful of parameters, the ship speed, the course, um, really a very small handful of parameters. And so it, the audio quality was not very good. Um, we can say that there was a lot of microphone placement issues with a, a curtain going back and forth. It was required to have 12 hours of data. It ended up having 26 hours of data and about 19 hours of usable voice data. In addition okay. to some of the other parameters, navigation parameters I mentioned. Okay. Thanks, Morgan. Um, a couple of safety related questions here. Uh, Ron would like to know, uh, what's your best guess on when personal locator beacons might be required? Well, Ron, I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, <laughs> oh. uh, it's one of these rulemakings where going back to a previous question about cost benefit analysis. So we make recommendations on, on equipment, particularly areas where we require new equipment by ship owners. Um, so it becomes a cost benefit analysis and the Coast Guard is a regulator they have to follow a, a notice of proposed rulemaking process. Uh, and so they, they receive public comments and they, uh, they follow their process and then they try to fulfill the recommendation. I will tell you this, the Coast Guard, their own investigation, their own report to the Commandant agreed with us um, and they also proposed the same type of requirement. But I think it's something that's gonna require a long, long effort, uh, one of, one of my asks to your organization and uh, when we do public outreach is we ask uh, the public and we ask people to, to uh, weigh in and, and advocate to their, to their uh, Congress, Senate, Coast Guard, uh, 
to appeal because I do believe it will help save lives. Um, we'll continue repeating that recommendation over and over again until we, until we get the job done. Um, they are now relatively inexpensive. Uh, people use them on hikes. People use them for an avalanche zone, very similar shore-based uh, transmitters. And we, find, we think it's time that crew members be afforded the same level of safety. So we'll keep advocating for it and we uh, could certainly use the help. Well, that's a good suggestion, Morgan. So what, what would, so where would somebody write to the Coast Guard? Would that be the best um, avenue to pursue? The Coast Guard, their Congress, congressional delegations, Senate, uh, other advocacy groups. Um, they might belong to groups like Boat US or um, other labor unions or whatever, you know, whatever avenue they feel comfortable with. Uh, again, this will be a long, uh, this will be a long pro protracted rulemaking, I believe. And there's, right now, there's no, no hint that they'll get started with that. But they, to be fair, the Coast Guard has many other, they've just completed a very large rulemaking on the towing industry, which was unregulated for decades. Uh, and now that the towing industry is regulated, uh, so the Coast Guard is doing a lot for safety, don't get me wrong. Um, so it just takes a long time, some time for these really good improvements to take place. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the other safety related question is um, from Veronica. Do you think that newer slashed enclosed lifeboats could have uh, survived the con could have survived the conditions and made any difference? Well, Veronica, I I, uh, I believe so. We we did mention that in the report, and we did recommend that the the uncovered lifeboats be replaced, something the Coast Guard did agree with, um, and the U.S. flagships will be required to re retrofit covered lifeboats. Um, it's not just the lifeboat, however, it's also the launching mechanism. If you look at modern ships today, they'll have one lifeboat on the stern, and it's essentially, every, if everyone's seen the movie Captain Phillips, uh, the, the Alabama, Marisk, Alabama had the stern launch lifeboat. Everyone got in the boat, they strap in, and then they pull a lever and the boat is then launched off a stern ramp. Uh, that would have been the best method to get off the ship in that particular circumstance. But side launch lifeboats can be very difficult when the ship is peeling over 15 degrees and uh, life rafts are also very difficult in a, a high wind conditions. So uh, we did make a recommendation that in addition to the covered lifeboats that the, need, the Coast Guard do a periodic review of all safety equipment on board ships every 20 years to look at all required safety appliances. Uh, and that would have covered the lifeboats, the life rafts, the GMBSS equipment, the, uh, the EPIRB, all that safety equipment. And we've asked the Coast Guard to do a periodic 20 year review so that you don't have a ship that's 50 years old running around with ancient equipment. Uh, again, that'll be a, a longer uh, effort, I believe, but I think it's, we owe it to the mariners to um, protect their safety. Thank you. Um, Mark has a question. He wants to know if the NTSB has investigated accidents near the Cape in recent years. We have. Uh, there was a there was a vessel, uh, a fishing vessel named the Oran Sea, and uh, the vessel was taken on water. The Coast Guard went to uh, re to help rescue the vessel because it was sinking or taken on water at that point. And the Coast Guard attempted to tow the vessel. And in the process, uh, one of the crew members of the Orange Sea uh, was, they were getting their life, their uh, survival suits on and it apparently had a heart attack. Um, and because the Coast Guard was involved in that particular incident and there was a fatality, it met our threshold and we did an investigation so that was uh, in the Massachusetts area. There was also an accident in June that we're investigating, a fishing boat called the Rebecca Mary, which happened south of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, so we uh, were in the neighborhood. Yeah, so unfortunately we have too much work for you. <laughs> so um, Morgan, one more question for you. That recently in the news there's been um, uh, sort of a new maritime uh, trend about automated or remote operated vessels. Does that present any safety challenges that uh, you can think of? So 
automated vessels have been around, the concept's been around for some time. Uh, there have been various experiments uh, throughout the last 20 years. But the developments in certain technologies such as GPS, uh, high bandwidth satellite communications, dynamic positioning, uh, and improved uh, artificial intelligence now actually makes the idea of automated vessels more realistic. Uh, there's an experiment going on right now in Norway with a, a vessel uh, that's going to be operating between two terminals and a fjord. Uh, that's going to be a one-year sort of test project uh, to see if autonomous vessels can work. One of the big issues with autonomous vessels is the, uh, the non-participant. So vessels that are not autonomous operating in an environment with autonomous vessels. Very similar to cars on the road. You have cars that are on autopilot and then they interact with other cars and, and same thing with vessels. Uh, there, there are, however, very great applications for autonomous uh, vessels. We've seen surveys, uh, automated surveys for large areas, such as the uh, MH370 search out in the Indian Ocean for the airplane that's missing. Uh, the, the military has been using drones or automated vessels for years. Uh, now there's some application in the marine firefighting, uh, because marine firefighting putting a vessel up to a burning tanker is very dangerous and they found a, a, a putting a drone or an autonomous fireboat up to a ship would be a good application for autonomous vessels. Um, also with dynamic positioning you could theoretically have a two or three vessels towing, tying up a ship at a, at a harbor terminal and all those vessels inputs could be tied into one, uh, one system where a pilot could actually use a joystick to dock the ship. Uh, one of the other concerns, of course, is the role of maritime pilots. Uh, most states require pilots to, to be a, an expert bringing the ship in. So if a ship is autom automated, you know, who, who's going to perform that role? And uh, so I, I, I think the future is going to be ships that have a skeleton, skeleton crew on board, a five or ten people on board that are constantly maintaining the ship, painting it, maintaining the engines, and uh, troubleshooting and then the ship would be automated and, and they could intervene if necessary. Um, so I think that's the next step. It's gonna be a hybrid. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned um, just in terms of resources, if the audience is interested in learning more about, well, the NTS NTSB certainly is a good place to go for information. And I think you have a lot of information on El Faro. Um, and the Coast Guard, uh, I believe it's the Marine Board of Investigation also publicizes uh, the report on El Faro. Is that right? So the, the Coast Guard will issue uh, and make public uh, select investigations. They, they don't publicize all of their investigations. Uh, I believe you could submit a FOIA request to get any particular investigation you were looking for. Uh, our agency is different. Every single investigation we do uh, we will put something out, uh, including the report and all the supporting documentation in a public docket. And those will be, there's typically a page for each one of our accidents. Uh, if it's currently under investigation, you will very likely not find much information on our side about it. Uh, but we're, we usually do that once the report is completed, we'll put all the information out. So uh, in the next few weeks, you'll see information come out about the uh, collision of the USS Fitzgerald and the container ship in Japan that happened three years ago. Uh, that'll be out coming out very soon. And uh, so that'll be on the website and you can, all of our reports going back decades are available online and uh, all the communication that the NTSB is present on Twitter and all the other social media uh, conglomerates. So. Thank you. Great. Um, so I think, I think we're finished with our, our Q&A and um, with the presentation. So, um, a, a, you know, a big thank you for, for all of your work and um, time that you spent with us. So what we'd like to do is send this to you in the mail, a small token of our appreciation. It's a uh, CMMC hat. Um, so it's got our logo and uh, we'll get it in the mail to you um, uh, for your great work with us tonight.
Thank you. So thank you. And I, I appreciate, um, we appreciate our members and our audience and thanks for all the great questions. Um, and we'll look forward to um, seeing you at our museum soon. And Morgan, you are welcome to come and see us uh, when you're up in Woods Hole. I look forward to that, Liz and Kristen, thanks again. And I do wanna thank uh, all the staff, you know, we I'm here presenting, but uh, none of this is possible without the staff at our agency do great work and write great products and they, they do a terrific job. We only have 11 investigators and we have four writers in the marine mode. So we're, we have approximately 21 persons in our office and they're all working uh, many accidents at a time and spend a lot of time away from families on occasion. So uh, I do want to thank them for all their hard work. So thank you. Well, thank you. Good night. Good night.